starting, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi everyone, this is Victoria Wajo Matnami. I um, just want to let you know a few things. Um, if you have any questions anytime during this webinar, what you need to do is um, click on the hand, raise your hand, and we'll unmute you so that you can ask any questions at that time. Um, also, if you have any other questions, you can also um, put them in the open your question box and type them in there and I'll read them when the question time is available. So without further ado, here's Joe McNamee. Hey, Victoria, how, how am I coming in here? Sounded good. Okay, all right. So we've we've switched around some instruments here and we've actually moved into a different unit. We're consolidating businesses into one unit and I'm creating a new business for my 12-year-old son. But uh, I probably will do a separate webinar on that later on. So um, it, those of you that have stopped by the office, you've seen a whole bunch of clocks, but we'll talk about that whole thing in a, a different webinar. But uh, uh, welcome everyone, and uh, let's uh, go ahead and get started with some Q&A if anyone has any questions. So uh, right off the bat, let's see what happens there if we ask for questions right now before I go into anything else. Vicki, do you see anyone with any questions? Uh, not at the moment. Okay, everybody's always so shy in the beginning. It just amazes me. I know. They usually have a lot of questions, but um, not at the moment. Oh wait, Jeff's got a question. Okay. Moment. Okay, Jeff, you have to unmute yourself. Okay, we good? Hey, Jeff. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Jeff, before you answer your question, are you on a computer or on a phone? Uh, I elected to go on my phone. Your phone. Okay. Is it an iPhone? It is. Okay. And no problem with unmuting yourself and being able to ask a question and all that kind of stuff. How did you let Vicky know that you had a question? Um, well, what you have to do, I had to tap on the screen because it, all I saw was Q&A with Joe. Okay. But when I tapped on the screen, uh, I got a bar up top, and there was a little hand, and I clicked on the hand. Okay. Yeah, we've we've had um we've had just a couple of people have some issues with that, so I just was curious um, you know whether it was their phone, if it was them not understanding, or if we were doing something wrong on this end. So, okay. Um, so go ahead and hit me, Jeff. Okay. Um, I actually have two questions, if you don't mind. I never mind questions. <laughs> okay, in your training, um, you discussed putting a second lien on the house when you lease opt in the house for more than you purchased from the original seller. Am I remembering that correctly? Okay, so um, there, when I'm buying or when I'm selling? When you sell the house. Okay, so when I'm selling, when I'm selling as the investor, you're Correct. asking about the uh, second mortgage that I put on there. So remember, Correct. I can't put a second on there until I've actually bought it. So if I'm leasing it, then I can't put a second on there. But when I okay. convert that to either seller financing, subject to, cash out sale, some other type of sale, uh, then I can go ahead and put my second on there. Now, there are a, a few ways that you can put liens against properties uh, in addition to that, but that's the way that I do it. That's the cleanest way. Right. Okay. So the follow-up to that is if things were to fall apart, is it easy enough to withdraw the second lien? Uh, can you cancel it out? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can um, uh, create a letter and send it to the original uh, individual that you were placing this lien with and, you know, cancel the lien saying that it's um, – it's you know completely null and void. Um, it's it's best if you do that through an attorney, um, 
But uh. that's one way of doing it. The second way of doing it is you can just sit back and wait until uh, some sort of a closing occurs with someone else. And then at that time, your lien is going to pop up and then they're going to uh, contact you and then you're going to put a paid in full you know, and, and do the same thing. Um, do, do you own this property? Is the deed in your name? I haven't done it yet. I, and, okay. and that hasn't happened. I, I just, you're just trying to be prepared in the event. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. I got you. Yeah. At, at any time you can cancel a lien, uh, on a property. So yeah, that's, that's not a, a hard thing to do, but you know, if you're, if you're like handing a property back over to uh, the original seller and transferring the deed back over, then, you know, um, you wouldn't, you probably wouldn't have a lien unless there was a buyer and then it's not you handing it back over. The buyer has actually bought it from you because you're only going to put that second in place when that buyer actually owns that property. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, okay, so I have the deed or I wouldn't have the deed anymore because the other guy does now because I sold him the house. I'm just in between basically. Right, right. And so if gotcha. you sold the house, let's say you took back a $25,000 second mortgage on it, so yeah. you, you, you have the house and you did that. Now that means that that tenant and buyer, whoever was – if you were doing a lease option or whatever you were doing with them, uh, once you convert that to seller financing or a subject to sale, anything that transfers that deed into that buyer's name, now that's where you do your seller carryback second. So then if something goes, you know, haywire there where the where the original uh, tenant and buyer that became the owner of that property is giving you the property back or giving it back to uh, the original seller that you bought it from, if you were doing like a subject to there, then um, that's where you would have to show that that lien has been satisfied. So you got several <laughs> steps to go through before you'll even have to worry about something like that. And then for you to have to worry about something like that would be really unusual. Okay. All right. Okay. And then the other question I had, um, and, it, and this has always made me apprehensive about doing anything. Um, <laughs> will, will Cheryl give her approval? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> That's a whole other yeah. – <laughs> Um, there are SEC rules that I've been told that prohibit us from pursuing investors or the ways you can pursue investors. Look, looking for private lenders, you mean? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, if you're looking for somebody to buy the property outright, that you're just marking it a property that you own. Correct. But if you're looking for someone to provide a loan to you, you know, when you say looking for investors, that that's that's a whole multiple different directions. So. I'm assuming the direction you're talking about is you're looking for a private lender. Correct. Okay. All right. So go ahead and ask me your question from there. Um, well, like case in point, I've got a guy. He wants to move on and do something else with his money. Um, so he would like to uh, have his position bought out. Okay. And I don't have the cash for it. Okay. So I wanted to pursue a a private party, but I'm apprehensive as to what I'm really legally allowed to do as far as telling somebody I'm looking for something like that. Right. I understand. But what's your question? How, what do you, are you, you, I'm sure you are, but I'm going to sound ignorant. Um, how can I legally go about maybe advertising or can I advertise the fact that I'm looking for an investor to step in, if you will, and um, take over the note that's currently available? Okay, so there's a, a lot of different ways to do that. You can communicate with uh, companies that are um, real, true, bona fide, private <laughs> lending companies. And they don't do – it's not like somebody's – uh, mother or grandmother who's providing you the loan and they're you know making a solid return on their you know a better rate of return on their investment capital um, but they these these types of companies advertise themselves as private lenders when in fact they're a I won't really call them a hedge fund they're kind of more like a um, a conglomeration of multiple people who have put their private funds with this firm 
and then this firm loans that money out, not like a bank does, but more uh, in a little bit more creative way. They still have their rules that, to follow. So that's number one. You can communicate with them anytime you want with no problems whatsoever. The uh, second direction is let's just say you want to find people who want to get a rate, better rate of return on their investment capital and there's no other business involved. So the first thing you have to know is you're not, you can't quote rates, you can't do any of that until you've established a relationship with them. So you, uh, a relationship doesn't mean that you have to know them for 20 years and they've got to have you know your same last name and stuff like that, but establishing a relationship with them and then making sure that you're following you know the guidelines on that. Now you, you can type in SEC rules all day long and find plenty of guidelines on that. But the the bottom line is that the, you first need to establish a relationship. So you can say that you're looking for you know people who are interested in taking part in your business of real estate investing and you know here's the things that you do and here's the things that you know they can take advantage of and they can get a better rate of return on their investment capital than whatever you want to say as the rest of that statement uh, could be better than what banks pay um, people with money and savings could be better than what banks pay or or uh, other other agencies pay for a five-year CD you know however you want to you want to state that, but you can't actually quote any kind of rates, what kind of investment capital, uh, at what kind of uh, rate return they're going to get until you've established a relationship with them. You also um, need to understand uh, there's a little tricky part here where um, it's got to be a deal that's in the future, not a deal in the past. So you could have this property and it's a deal in the future, not something that they're trying to fix for you from the past. Um, so this actually, what you're talking about here is not from the past. This is a, you know, you've already done this deal, but um, you've got it all set up, but there's a change to it. So now this is a future situation that's that's taking place. Um, instead of you sitting there, oh my gosh, I, uh, I took over this property, I actually bought it, I'm supposed to go to closing and I got to find the money for it now. That's not the case. You are finding someone to replace your private investor with a new private investor. Okay. Does that make sense? It does. Okay. Um, and, and one of the reasons I asked you, and, and yes, I know I can go online and, and look up all this stuff, but I don't really trust everything I find on the internet. So That's true. So who else would I tell you to see? With that, well, I, you do it all day long, so that's yeah. yeah. But I mean, there's, you know, you you can actually go uh, through the attorney route and look for attorneys, look for an attorney who handles that type of work. Now, just not not any type of attorney knows, you know, a an attorney that specializes in, you know, uh, private lending and SEC rules and all that kind of stuff. So then you can you can do that. Um, there's a lot of uh, places that are online that you can ask the question to and they have you know different branches different sections that have you know specialists in each one of those areas and so you can go that route so um, and then of course you can look at the reviews and all that kind of stuff of the site you're dealing with you know not just some guy said hey you know I took this course you know two yeah. years ago I was yeah. in a seminar and and here's what you can do and here's what you can't do you, exactly. know, you have to be careful of that and there's a lot of gurus Claim to be gurus out there. Claim they know everything, but you know, you just—I just don't trust them. Yep. And you know, the the um, the go-to button for me is, you know, I don't know the answer to every single thing. And right. And, and the other thing is that some some things change so much that it's, you know, you might know it this year, but next year it's a little bit different, and you weren't yeah. in the loop to know, you know, the how it's going to change and and how it did change and what it's what it's going into now. Okay. Can a relationship, the term relationship, can that be basically, hey, hi, I'm Jeff, you're, you're Joe, now we have a relationship? Um, no, I think that you'd, um, they need to you know, meet you, see a little bit of your business, maybe do a, a little bit of a tour of properties, um, you know, uh, a little bit about you and how you're set up and, you know, something a little bit more than just hi, hi, shake hands and now, <laughs> now you have the, your relationship. I would think it needs to be a little bit more than that. They need to have a good understanding. You know, one of the things that I tell everybody that, you know, especially the, the ones that are the gurus that teach private, you know, how to find private lenders, 
you know, there's one thing that most of them, as a matter of fact, I've never heard any of them uh, talk about this one piece. And, and the most important thing is put yourself in the person who is the private lender's world. And in that private lender's world, you know, if they put their money in a uh, place that, you know, if somebody flies an airplane into a building and it, they lose most of their income or most of their principal even, all of their income's gone and their principal, you know, a lot of that's gone. Um, those are not safe places. I, I, I could have, you know, lots of fistfights with stockbrokers who would say they are, but that's because that's where they make their money. Um, right. but, but the bottom line is that when you show them a system that, builds a list of buyers that are salivating at the mouth, chomping at the bit, just hoping to get the opportunity to move into one of your properties, and a list of backup buyers for that property, that's a pretty solid thing to show a private investor because where's the income coming from for that private investor to re receive their share of this deal? And it's from your system because anybody can have one tenant and buyer or one renter, but if they don't have a system to keep that going, that's a very dangerous thing. So you having that conversation, showing a little bit about that, um, you know, not trying to teach them how to be a real estate investor, but showing them that you have the system, that, that's pretty good relationship building right there. Okay. Thanks, right. man. That, that's it for me. Okay. All right. Any other questions out there, Vicki? Yes, we have one from Lewis. Lewis, um, can you, are you able to talk or do you need to type in your question? Hello, Lewis. Okay. Um, from, Lewis from, has from what Jeff said, if I don't know if Lewis has an iPhone or not, but you have to double tap on the screen, then that bar comes up to where you can unmute yourself and that might be where his problem has been in the past. All right. Okay, we'll we'll wait to see if he can uh, come back on or somehow come back up with us. I, I don't understand, but every single time there's a problem where we can't get his question asked. He he clicks on it to raise his hand, right? Yes, but um, Lewis, what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, take your hand off, and if you can figure out how to come on to talk or to type, just do that again for me, okay? All right. Okay, anyone else? Uh, um, hold on one second. Oh, Jeff said to single tap. Oh, single tap. Okay, single tap on your screen if it's an iPhone. I don't even know if he has an iPhone or not, but... You know, everybody out there, I am... I actually... Uh, have several different computers, and the laptop that I'm using right this minute to talk to you on, to hear you on, was um, this was I think it was I can't remember if it was $199 or $299, but you know less than 300 bucks, and I can do anything and everything that I need to do as a real estate investor and a trainer teacher of this stuff out there. I can build. I've built multiple different businesses and will continue to do that. I've done. Um, right now, I'm in the middle of a, a $2.4 million deal with an, a student. My computer does everything I need it to do to do all that stuff. So it's not like you have to go spend $1,000 on a computer. Um, there's several different computers out there, and just a simple little $10 or $20 headset uh, to go along with this. That's that's all you need, and if, if you don't have a computer, I, it, it amazes me. I know there's a lot of things you can do on your phone, but, man, is it so much easier to set things up and file things away on a computer that's sitting safely somewhere instead of your phone that you're carrying in and out of everything you're doing and can damage it at any time. Okay, um, any other questions there, Vicki? Um, no, I'm not seeing any at okay. the moment. So, I'm still trying to work with Lewis. So. Okay, so if Lewis comes back on um, to be able to ask a question, let me know, okay? okay. All right, guys. Let me move on here. So I want to, whoops. Okay. So 
people have asked uh, – Vanessa, that should make you very happy – uh, people have asked about you know where I get my signs at, and there used to be a company that it used all the time for, gosh, I don't know, maybe 15 years, 20 years, something like that, and it was Zebra Graphics, and they're right down the street from me. Well, Zebra Graphics, I don't know what happened with them. It was a family-run business. Um, we've known the family for years. We see them out all the time, different places. We have not seen any of them. In probably more than six months, so we try. You know, we got to the point where we were out of pointer signs, and you know, of course, you're supposed to order before you're out. Well, no, all of a sudden we realize, oh hell, <laughs> you know, we have a closet full of all different kinds of signs. Oh, where's the point? There's no more. Oh my god. So we went to try to get some more signs, and lo and behold, they have closed up shop. Uh, I guess they're out of business, cannot find them, can't find any of them to even find out where they were doing their orders from. So uh, I started searching for uh, someone to make signs, and um, while I was searching locally, I stumbled across a few different companies that are online. So I decided to try one of them. So this online sign company right here, it's Delivery Signs, uh, that is... They we I didn't want to tell anybody the name of the company until I used them, tested them out. Um, one of the things that happened actually it happened. I think there was two or three different mistakes, but none of the mistakes were on their end. All of them were on my end, placing the order. Imagine me pushing the wrong buttons. <laughs> it happens all the time. But uh, anyway, so everything I did, they were right there to help me through get get everything straight. Uh, when my sign showed up, they were just as good a product that I've always gotten out there. And so I was very happy with them and it ended up being a lot cheaper, even with the delivery and all that stuff included in there, cheaper than me getting them down the street. So um, this is the company that I, I use now, Delivery Signs. Now, one of the things that I want to make clear to you, if you're ordering several signs, this makes sense. If you're ordering one sign, two signs, you might want to compare it to someone who's local to you. Let's say that you're going to do uh, a commercial property and you want a four foot by eight foot commercial sign. I just had a, you know, someone talk to me about that the other day to have some advice on that because they're, they're wanting to do their own type of sign for a large commercial property. And so this is where, you know, Zebra Graphics came in really helpful there because I'm getting a one off on that. So um, you probably can order something like that from delivery signs, but you might want to kind of compare the price of doing that with delivery signs or doing that with somebody local. Um, so there's there's your uh, sign connection. I, I have had no problems with them. They've done a great job for me. I made a few mistakes. It was my fault. Um, you know, doing this online, obviously those mistakes wouldn't happen if I'm standing on the opposite side of the counter of someone who's physically right there in my presence and then someone who I've used and they've got a, a library, a file of me on hand of all my different signs and sizes and all. So with delivery signs, eventually we'll get to that point. We'll go ahead and, and create an entire library and then uh, y'all can just say that you want to use the same, you know, sign number four in the library or sign number two in the library or what have you. But for right now, you can just go and tell them what you want, click on the sizes, colors, all that stuff, and how you want the lettering to be. Now, keep this in mind when you're when you're ordering signs, it's always cheaper when you jump up in the number of signs that you order. Uh, and the reason for that is that the uh, when you're ordering, let's say you're ordering uh, 30 signs. Well, they're not going to hand make that sign. They're going to have that uh, done, manufactured, whether they do it in shop or in house, or they have someone that they, you know, order through. But those are usually, I guess it's still called screen printing. But they'll they'll screen print it. Um, they'll they'll print this out through a machine, and so it's an you know. A, once they set the whole thing up and it's going to do multiple signs and cut them the right size and all that, uh, that ends up being cheaper when you're getting a, uh, a lot of them. When you're doing one or two signs, it's not worth setting up the machine for that. So then it's a matter of them hand handling that sign by attaching – and I, I use coroplastic, so attaching vinyl lettering to the coroplastic. So um, there's – there's the stuff on the signs. You know, we have some free training videos out there that teach you all about how to do signs and, 
and uh, what way to do them, where to put them, all that kind of stuff. But anyway, there's your sign information. Okay. Hey, Joe. Yes. Okay, Vanessa, she wanted to know, um, do they know your name? And what would, she said you want to know your, if they know your name, and it would be helpful, you know, mentioning you or talking to someone. I, and then, I haven't. Uh, I haven't ordered enough to say for sure that they would know my name. Um, so all, all I did was I ordered a batch of pointer signs, and then I talked to them about a lot of the students and all that would be probably coming through them. So you can try it and see. Um, there is a rep that I dealt with. I do not have that girl's name in front of me. Uh, I'll look for it and see if I've got it somewhere. So if you dealt with the same rep that I dealt with, then, you know, um, they probably, she probably will remember me, probably more so from the mistakes that I made trying to get that damn first order done. But uh, other than that, okay. All right, and then she want to know what the URL is. Is it the deliverysigns.com? Yeah, it's, right, it's right there. It's deliverysigns.com with a forward slash on it. It's right there underneath the words online sign company, HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash www dot deliverysigns.com forward slash. So you probably can just put in deliverysigns.com forward slash and it'll come up. Okay. Okay. Now, um, Lewis is on now. Okay. Um, uh, with his question. Okay. He said, how, how do I get the buyer to commit to the property before I have it under control? You would never market a property that you don't have under control to find any kind of buyer. You've got to have a contract on this, otherwise you're breaking the law. So you've got to have a contract on the property so that then you can market the property and find potential buyers. Now, once you find a potential buyer, now you go back to the seller, discuss with them, let, let the buyer give you a, uh, a down payment or an application receipt agreement on that property. And so then when, once you have the application receipt agreement, you've got some funds to prove that they're not full of crap, that, that, end, that potential end buyer. Then you go back to the seller and you talk to the seller and say, here is a way that we can do this deal. Are you interested? You're not teaching them all about what your end buyer is telling you and this, that, and the other, but you're saying what you can do between you and the seller. Between What's between you and the end buyer is none of the seller's business. And then you once you have the seller comfortable, they're okay, then you create your agreement with the seller, whatever type of agreement it is, then you go back to the end buyer and say, okay, yes, we can go ahead and do this deal. But when you're having the first conversation with the end buyer and they're putting money against it with the application receipt agreement, you let them know that there's another person or people or organization or whatever involved in making this final decision. This is what I think we can do, but I've got to verify that and make sure first. Then that's when you go back and you talk to your seller. Okay, next question. Um, that's all the questions I have for the moment. Okay, all right. Um, how did Lewis actually get to do that question that time? Was he typed it in? Obviously, yeah. was he on a he computer or on his phone? Um, you know, I do not know. Okay, so ask him that, or actually, I just did. So hopefully, he'll answer you what he's on and what kind of phone and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, okay. He said he was on the phone, and let's see here. He has another question. Wait a minute. What uh, kind of what kind of phone is it? Is it an iPhone or a Droid or what? Um, uh, that'll probably take just a minute. Okay. Uh, and, then the, uh, and then the other thing is, I know he has another question. I still want to get this because he's at, he's tried multiple times and it hasn't worked. I just don't like that. I want to make sure people can get into this and ask questions. So the other point that I want to make sure of is that I don't understand why he's typing it if he's on a phone. Uh, or a computer instead of talking it. It's way better to talk it. So um, Jeff was just on a phone, so he was able to talk. So I, I just want to get that as clear as we can get it with him. Okay, now hit me with the question. Okay, his other question is, um, is pertaining to, the, I think, the first thing you were talking about. Um, he's meaning, how do I know I can I can have the market speak? knowing I can get the buyer to buy after I get it under control. Well, when you're putting, know how to get the market to speak, so, I, so okay, when, you're put, when you're putting the property under control, you're spending $10. 
So you're risking nothing but 10 bucks. Then you're letting the market speak to you to see what kind of people pop up, who, what they have to work with, how much money they can do down, how much they can do a month, what's the total monthly income of, listen here, all adults responsible for making the payment on that house. Uh, I say that all the time. People don't get what I'm talking about there. So just this morning, there was a call that came through. None of the staff was here, so I took the call. Then it was a lady looking for a house for her um, I guess it was her son and daughter-in-law. And uh, so her and her husband, the lady and her husband, are taking on the responsibility of making sure that the son and daughter-in-law can make the payments. So it's kind of like me setting up a co-signing agreement. So what's the total monthly income of all adults who are going to be responsible for making sure that payment's being made? I used to say all adults living in the house. Now I say all adults that are going to be – because the, the, that mother and father are not going to be moving into that house. They have their own place. So they're providing funds uh, and backup on their you know, uh, son and daughter-in-law moving into this house, one of my properties. So anyway, um, so you're wasting 10 bucks to see if the market will be able to make a, a good enough payment to you to where you can end up with more money than what the seller needs out of the house. All right, so that's how you're looking to get the market to speak. So some people will go, oh my gosh, well, I'm spending $10 and I'm spending all this time. Well, yes, but you're getting buyers on your list that cost you nothing but that $10 because of that one house that you have marketed out there. So those buyers that are going on your list, most of those buyers are not going to buy that house. Only one is if you can make it work and if the seller is going to be happy with what you can do. The, um, but that's how you build that list, okay? Okay, he, um, one more thing pertaining to that. He said the house I've been working on is now in Brenda and my possession. Okay. Um, well, he, got, he went to closing, and, and now it's his house. The deed's transferred, and he's got a loan on that property, right? He said, I got an appraisal. I got the appraisal to 143. Can I sell it for 165? And he said, yes, as far as um, he did go to closing and all that. So. Okay. All right. So his appraisal that he got, when that appraisal was done, did the appraiser ask for the contract between him and the seller? See, this is why it's better if you're talking to me, Lewis. There's a ton of things that you got to be able to go back and forth with me on instead of me waiting for you to answer that question and Vicky reading it back to me and all that kind of stuff. Okay, he said no. The appraiser did not ask for the contract? That's the first time in the history of an appraiser when there's a contract deal happening that did not ask for a contract. I'll, I'll just, guarantee you he doesn't realize it that the appraiser did ask that, and he probably asked it from the it was probably asked from the seller or the bank. So anyway, okay, so you can sell that property. It's your property. You can sell it for whatever you want. Here's where the caution is. The caution is that you can't go down the road of thinking, well, I bought it for 147, or I bought it for let's say 120. The appraiser said it's worth 147, and I think I can sell it for 163 because Joe said so. Well. You can, but you're going to have to do some terms on that because the bank is only going to loan someone else out there a certain amount towards that 147 or that 163. So they may only own loan 70% uh, of 147. Well, I don't know what that's going to be. Maybe 110. I'm just guessing. All right, so 110 or, or one. A hundred thousand. So, what are you going to do about the difference there? You know, so that's where the creativity comes into play, and that's where you know all the different techniques that you've learned to jumpstart can apply towards this. So, but yes, all day long you can sell that for more than the appraised value. Okay, there's no other questions right now. Okay, all right. Um, so let's go on to this next thing. All right, I think I've got a video. I'm, we're going to see, let's see here. I thought I evidently, the video that I tried to put on here is not here. I'm going to place, I'm going to place a video in the membership site. So that's in the American Real Estate Investing and Business um, uh, Membership Site Club. But uh, 
I did a quick little uh, I think it was like 47 second video on uh, a unique way that I do that cleans carpet, cleans certain things off a of carpet. Um, you've seen a lot of different things that we've done out there with carpet cleaning. Um, this one here it was, <laughs> I mean, it blew everybody's mind. It's like, I, I don't even think about all the different things that I do that you know, real estate investors would love to know that little trick. So I had a, um, what we did was when we were um, consolidating businesses into one of the suites in one of my commercial buildings, we took down a part of a wall that had some paint on the carpet where the wall was. You could even hardly tell the paint was there until you remove the wall and then there's the paint on this carpet. And that paint, I said eight years, but it actually was 18 years ago that this paint got put onto that carpet. So um, this little video will show you how I took it off and all it took was um, a, a file that comes, you know, that's for filing metal, a uh, simple little file and a chisel. And so it took the, car the paint right off and the carpet looks brand new in that spot like it, it was never there. So uh, you, can, you can take a look at that video and add that to your toolbox of things that you can do. It doesn't work for everything, but it worked for that uh, situation. And you know, you'll, you'll find a use for that over and over and over again. Okay, um, so the next thing that I wanna do is I wanna talk about um, an offer that I'm putting out there to people. Uh, I know there's several of you that are here right now waiting for this part. So I do different types of mentoring and I listen to problems out there and I hear problems over and over again. I'll, I'll, I'll flip through different social media, LinkedIn. Um, I'll go into Twitter. I'll go into um you know, Facebook and, and different groups and all, and I see a lot of chatter uh, there where people are having problems. So one of the things is they they became a real estate investor, they got some properties under control, and they're making you know you know hundreds of dollars a month profit off of each one of their properties, but they don't know how to jump that income up significantly. Um, so there's some things that I do have done and will continue to do that increases my cash flow without having to do anything else with uh, getting more properties or doing something a little different. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you many different ways to increase your cash flow, whether you're doing more deals or you're doing the same deals that you've been doing, and get more cash flow out of the same ones. And it's not just asking the, the tenant and buyer for more money. Um, so this this is going to be a private training that we're gonna make it live, uh, live online. It's, it's not gonna be live. In, you know what, it, the local people, if they wanna come live in class while we're doing this uh, as a, uh, a live webinar, um, that, that'll be fine. But this is going to be very inexpensive for the people that are, you know, in my memberships groups. Um, you know, whether you're, if you're already a Jumpstart student, a Force Your Success student, if you're already in the membership site, um, the paid membership site, then the discount is going to be the same. This is going to cost everyone else $697. But all of you in there, we're going to take $300 off that. So it's going to be $397 for those of you who are there. If you pay now, if you wait until we start advertising this out there, it's $697 for everybody. So I'm letting you all know up front that you can save $300 for this to learn how to make more than $397 extra off of just one deal every single month. All right, so that's $397 for everyone that's on this call right now and everyone that's in the membership site, Jumpstart, uh, Force Your Success. Outside of that, when we start marketing that, we're going to market that. We'll probably start marketing that by the beginning of, well, probably by the end of February. So, um, but then once we start that, the price for everyone is six ninety seven. All right, so this is your opportunity to call back to the office. There's no link or anything for you to click on. Call back to the office and say that you want to sign up for that, and uh, Victoria will 
collect your 397 on it, put you on that uh, seating list. And like I said, you can sit here live during it or you can be online for it. Okay, any questions about that offer? Um, I'm not sure about this, but Chris said, you had me at, I have training. <laughs> okay. Chris loves it because every time uh, I say to do something, Chris does it and he makes money. <laughs> he doesn't whine, waller, or complain, or you know, try to second guess, triple guess, quadruple guess. He goes, look, that guy's been doing that, and I've been there, I've seen it, I I make money, so I just do it. So it's I just I appreciate you saying that, Chris. But uh, that's that's funny though. Okay. Um, um, Lewis has another question. Okay. Where do I go to find out the rules and regulations on real estate investing so I can keep myself out of the looking like I'm selling real estate without a license? Okay. Well, you can sell real estate without a license if you own it or if you have a contract on it. So you have a vested interest in that property. You can sell your position on the contract. But – when you're trying to sell someone else's property that you don't have anything on, that's where you get yourself in trouble. So that's that's number one answer I want to make sure you get right there. Number two, your investor-friendly attorney in your local area will answer any and every question. You just have to be careful. You, you could go in, sit down. I've had many students go in and sit down and do that, but they go in with a plan. I've seen the ones go in without a plan, without being organized, and – they end up spending lots of money on lots of hours of information from that attorney. You know, that attorney's, you know, it depends on where you're at and, you know, how successful they are, um, how long they've been doing this. You might pay 250 an hour up to $1,000 an hour just to sit there and basically pick the attorney's brain. Remember, that's what they're, they do this business for is to offer up advice. Now, um, there are some where, if they really feel confident that you're going to become a real estate investor or already are in the local area and they're going to get a lot of let's just say closings out of this a lot of real estate deals or or money from you know doing deals with you or having you do them through them um that they won't charge you anything there's many times i'll go and i'll sit and have long chats with all of my attorneys that it never cost me a dime that way i, I told a story many years ago that i I had one attorney drive five hours on a Sunday morning to be in a classroom full of real estate investing students at 9 a.m. on a Sunday morning. So he had to leave his, his place a little bit before 4 a.m., and he did all that. And then he sat there on stage, and I picked his brain. They picked his brain. They verified everything that you know they wanted to know from him about the things that I do. Um, and so – it cost me nothing, and we were probably on stage for maybe two hours together, so five hours of driving, uh, two hours of on stage, and then five hours of driving back w without charging me anything. But because I do so many deals through him, or at that time I did a lot more deals than I do now. I spend more time with my students than I do my own deals, but um, so that he did that for me as a – just a favor. So. Um, when you're looking for advice, the uh, the real estate investor attorney, I'm never going to try to overrule that attorney, even if they're wrong. I'm not. I'm just going to tell you, it sounds to me like you might have the wrong attorney, but you know, I always will preface that or follow that up with I might be wrong because things could have changed. But usually, um, that's the case where. Once once we get to that point, and and you'll you'll be amazed. There's times where a, an investor friendly attorney you'll sit down with them, and they've never heard of some of the very simple, basic, elementary things that we do. That's a little tiny bit creative. They only understand. I have a house. I want to sell this house, and. I owe this much on it, so the person coming in to buy it has to have 
at least that much money, plus money to pay the attorney, the closing costs, plus to pay the if there's a realtor involved, and maybe there's back taxes or whatever on it. So once uh, you get beyond that, a lot of real estate attorneys have never done anything else beyond that. So when they hear things, sometimes some of them go, well, matter of fact, I remember this one who's pretty close to me. He, um, he said uh, to me, he said, my attorney told me that you can't do that stuff in my county. Well, you can do it in all, the other 3,000, you know, 100 and some odd counties in the United States, but you can't do it in this guy's county. And it's like, it's just ridiculous. But you, you know, you get that kind of stuff that happens. So, but um, that's where you go to get the information. And just like uh, when Jeff was asking about SEC rules on finding private investing, private lenders, you know, there's attorneys that specialize in certain things. Uh, you can go online and look for that. But um, for someone who's just getting started, done a couple of real estate deals in their life, maybe a couple of dozen in their life, you know, a, a local real estate attorney who maybe wants to, maybe already knows a lot of different things in, in addition to, you know, being that investor friendly attorney, in addition to just a standard real estate sale uh, and, and wants to learn more, I'm more than happy to speak with them. So, okay. Any other questions sitting there? Yes. Um, Lewis said, I'm just waiting to make sure I'm within the safety zone of this where I'm not going to get in trouble. Okay. So, Lewis, you have bought a house. You have a mortgage on the house, I'm assuming. And uh, it's you and Brenda who went to closing. So, you have this house now. You own this house. The deed is in your name. The bank has a deed to secure debt, but you have the deed. You can do anything you want with that house, with selling it. You can put somebody in there under a lease option. If you were in the state of Texas, you're not allowed to do a lease option. But you, in the state of Georgia, you can do a lease option, a lease purchase. You can sell it uh, subject to and take back a second, carry back a second mortgage on it. You can sell it for cash. You can sell it for what you owe on it and carry back a second mortgage for the balance of what you still wanted out of it. You can create payments. You, you got to follow certain rules. I mean, you can't, you know, and you got to use sense about it. You, you know, let's say that uh, the house appraised for 147, you bought it for 120, you put 10,000 into the house and you want to sell it for 165. That there's nothing wrong with that. But if you say you want to sell it for Four sixty-five, and eh, something a little bit wrong with that. There, that's just that just that's out of way out of kilter. All right, um, but uh, there, there's so many different ways you can sell it subject to, and you can do a seller carry back second. So, uh, let's say your monthly payment is is uh, eight hundred dollars a month on this, and taxes and insurance are one hundred fifty, so you're paying nine fifty out. You can sell that house, and let's say it's one hundred and twenty-five thousand that you have a mortgage for it on. I'm just making up numbers. So you can sell it subject to for the 125 for the 850 a month, but you wanted another $40,000 out of it. They paid you 10 down, so you still got 30 that you can do a seller carry back second on. So let's say that you do a seller carry back second. Let's say that your first mortgage is a 4% interest rate and you want to do a second on it. Somewhere around 7% is fair. If you did a 5.5% interest rate, somewhere around 85 or so is fair for your second mortgage. You do a seller carry back second, they're paying you the $30,000 over time. Let's say it's uh, 300 bucks a month. So they're paying you the 850 plus they're paying you the 300, which is eight, nine, 10, 1150 a month they're paying to you and you're paying the 850, which is the taxes, the insurance, the principal and the interest. You do it on a wrap to protect yourself so that you don't get uh, if the first isn't being paid, it can be foreclosed on and wipe you out. But if you do it on a wrap, you don't get wiped out. They've got to pay you the full amount. Instantly you know when the payment is behind because they didn't make that first payment. That's when you go into finding out what's going on. If they say they can't make any payments anymore, then you go the route of foreclosing on the property or just having them sign it back over to you, which is what they'd rather do than have their credit damaged. And so you take the property back over and you put a new tenant and buyer in place. If you're taking the property back over and you actually transfer the deed into their name, you have to go to a closing, 
for them to transfer that back over to you. If they've got any kind of um, liens or anything behind what you have, so there's a first to your bank, there's a second to you, let's say there's a third and a fourth to for a swimming pool and uh, a, a third for a swimming pool company and there's a fourth for some sort of, um, maybe they're behind on taxes, you know, income taxes or something like that. So in that case, you would foreclose on it to wipe those other to the third and the fourth lien off of it. Your lien's no longer to be valid because you're taking the property back over and now you're gonna put a new tenant and buyer in place once you've got that deed transferred back over to you. Doesn't take long to do that. 30 days, maybe 60 days and you're, you're finished with that in the state of Georgia. Okay, any other questions out there, Vicki? Not right now. Okay, well if it's not right now, it's not gonna be ever because we're about to end this. So um, listen guys, I gave you some good information on the sign company. If anybody uses that sign company and has any problems, let me know. I'll deal with them directly, and then we'll look for someone new. Um, I won't be ordering as many signs as I used to because, like I said, I'm more steering towards doing more deals with students than I am doing my own deals. All right, and uh, if you want to get involved with uh, learning these other techniques that I've told you about, my discounted offer here, uh, you need to turn right around and call back to the office. If you don't get us today, call back tomorrow. Get us. It's three ninety seven for you. But after that, uh, once we start advertising this, it'll be six ninety seven for everyone. Okay. I do. You have another question there, Vicky? Um. Yes. Um. Okay. First of all, Lewis said thank you, and it looks like Kevin has a question. So hold on just a moment. Kevin. Kevin. Kevin, you can unmute yourself. <clears throat> Hello. Hello, Kevin. Hey, can you hear me? Mm. I wouldn't have said hello back to you if I couldn't. Thanks <laughs> <laughs> hey, for uh, that commercial. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hear me now? Okay. <laughs> hey, I've got a, uh, I've got a house. Um, this one's in North Carolina. It's a mobile home, and there was a situation with it where there's a lien against the property right now, or against the mobile home, okay. and I'm wondering is can is that lien just going to sit there? Because I noticed I actually saw a copy of the lien. I'm not looking at it right now, but I believe it did say something about that. That lien is enforceable to sell, sale the property is how it was worded. S A L E. So is that lien at some time going to give that person? It's the, uh, it's the person who runs the park who put the lien against the mobile home uh, or against the person. So the question is, is that lien, just going to sit there until it's paid off or does the, or will that park manager actually have the right to sell that home at some point well um it, mobile home parks you'd be surprised at how many times you either have attorneys who are either the owner of the mobile home park or they're in partnership with the owner of the mobile home park so they've designed their system to make it really really difficult for someone to who has bought a mobile home and moved it into that park for them to pick that mobile home up and move it first of all it's going to be somewhere around twenty five hundred dollars if it's a single wide five thousand dollars if it's a double wide just to pick it up and relocate it so, yep. and then if you have to if you have to tear porches off of it if you have to uh, put it somewhere else and get you know the water um, septic power tied into it, uh, tied down on a permanent foundation, a pad has to be built first for it to go in place. W once you get done with all that, somebody who owes maybe, you know, a thousand to five thousand dollars, maybe even ten thousand dollars, they're just going to walk away from the mobile home. So yeah. I want you to just keep that in mind, number one. Number two, the lien that's on the trailer itself, the mobile home itself, that lien is like a lien against a car. Very difficult to enforce a lien against the car. However, they own the mobile home park, so they control who moves stuff in and out. I'm assuming yeah. that the land was is not part of the deal, that the lot is owned by the park and the mobile home is owned by an individual. That's correct. Okay. Now, how much is that lien on that mobile home? Um, last I saw it was about 4500 Okay, and so they're probably looking at back rent and all that that they didn't get for. Are you assuming that they the park doesn't own? Uh, they're they're only looking for rent on their lot 
uh, and they haven't been receiving it, and maybe some fines for you know not keeping up with the ordinance, you know, the covenants for that park. Exactly. Okay. All right. So now, now that we talked about all that, ask me your question again on that. Um, I was just wondering, is that lien going to be enforced to where the park owner can actually sell that property? Um, well, they first ha they have to get control of the title. They're going to have to get control uh -huh. of the title. Now, is the seller still in? Um, is the seller still available? I mean, or is the seller dis has the seller disappeared or what? Um, the situation is the seller has not been allowed to live in that park for over a year yet they maintain their payments on the house so they're only two, <laughs> yeah <laughs> they're only two payments behind on the house so they're, um, but they're on the purchase of the home on the Correct. purchase of the mobile home but not on the rent, the lot rent yeah the lot rent's been behind for a year okay wow $4500 Okay. All right. So actually, no, that's only about, what is that? That's, that's less than, that's about 300 and, what is that? 375 yeah, a month? Somewhere. Ago? Okay. Yeah. All right. So um, the, the park owner is in a, a strange situation. They're not making any income, but they're hoping that they can get control of that mobile home so that then they can turn around and rent the lot and the mobile home out. See, that's right. why they make it difficult. That's why you can't put signs outside. You can only put yes. it in your window and all yeah. that kind of stuff. And they so, are extremely difficult. They're almost yeah. impossible to deal with. Yeah. They're very, yes. ru very rude. And, and so, <laughs> and, yeah, I understand. <laughs> but that's their that's their business model because it's profitable yep. for them down the road because, you know, yes. eventually the person just gives up. Um, yeah. So, and that's kind of why it, it makes me want to pursue this deal all the more, even though it seems complicated, because right. I just want to help this person get out of there. How much is owed on the mobile home itself? The loan on the mobile home? Um, I think there's about eighty left, and eighty thousand. Yes, and it's in beautiful shape. Okay. All right. So there's a whole lot cheaper deals out there. I don't know yep. the condition of this home and all that kind of stuff, but there's a whole yeah. lot cheaper deals out there. What's the monthly payments on it? Um, monthly payments, I think, are, I want to say they're 900 PITI. Did you, did you say that the, um, they were two months behind on the payments on the mobile home itself? Yep. Okay. All right. So do they have the funds to relocate the mobile home? Um, not that I'm aware of. I'm okay. kind of looking for that through my end buyer. Yeah, that, um. I mean, unless you've got everything all set up, that that one's like pushing a wet rope up your nose, uh, up the hill with your <laughs> nose. Yeah, I mean, it can be done, but who wants yeah. to go through all that? So that yeah. one's that one's one of those ones that it's not low hanging fruit. Um, unless you've got everything else set up, there's a buyer sitting there who's going to pay you, say, a hundred and ten thousand, so you can pay the forty five hundred dollars and you can pay the 80 grand or you know there's uh ten thousand dollars coming to you and you can uh pay the 4500 and uh then someone's going to take over the debt on that mobile home you know it's right cash flow i mean you just have to kind of look at it that way kevin to, to see yeah but uh but that lean and you know your question really is will that follow that mobile home it's very difficult. It'd be like somebody trying to put a lien on your car. Um, it, you can put a lien. The person who's selling the car, who's uh, selling it on time, can put that lien on there. To put, but to put another lien against that car because you owe them money because you parked that car on on their property, eh, that's a little bit difficult there. I, I think I'd kind of defer a little bit of that towards a, an attorney. Look for an attorney, yeah. an investor-friendly attorney who's a country attorney. They're going to be um, they're going to be a little bit more knowledgeable in the mobile home world. Um, but again, the moving company's got to be able to come in and utilize the park's um, road and all that kind of stuff to right. pack up and move this. So uh, that could become could become an ugly issue there. Yep. Yep. And. Yeah, it's pretty complicated. <laughs> yep. There's a lot of moving parts to this yep. one. That's right. So if it's not low-hanging fruit, even though you're trying to help somebody out, uh, should you do it? Only you know the answer to that. Yeah. So, Okay. Okay. All right. Any other questions out there? All right. Thank you, Joe. You're welcome.
Vicky. Yes, um, Lewis does. He has a question. Okay. He says, real quick, I bought the house and property for 80000 I improved to 147 So that's the one I think he's wanting to know if he could ask like 165 for. Absolutely. Uh, nobody says that you can't. You know, um, Lewis, the shoes that you're wearing right this minute, if um, – if I wanted to buy them for five dollars, would you sell them to me? And the answer is probably no. If I wanted to buy them for five hundred dollars, what would the answer be? I, I, I know you, Lewis. I'm, I'm sure you're probably not wearing five hundred dollar shoes. Um, you, you know. So if you paid seventy dollars for them and I want to buy them for five hundred, you have the right to sell it to me for five hundred. Nobody can tell you you can't. Okay. All right. Um, any other questions, Vicky? Um, no, that's it for now. Okay, guys. So if you want to do this offer, um, give us a call. Do it quick. Uh, it's three ninety seven. The end of February. It'll be six ninety seven for everyone. All right. I will talk to you all soon. All right. Take care now.